Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Informatica World 2016. Brought to you by Informatica. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Francisco for Informatica World 2016. Exclusive coverage from SiliconANGLE Media's theCUBE. It's our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Peter Burris. Our next guest is Sri Potanini, who's the Chief Technology Officer in Applications and Data with JLL. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thanks for having me here. So, real estate, big opportunity for a lot of data. It's a challenge when you think about the IOT opportunity. You guys have done some work. Share with us what you guys are doing um, and how you're using data. So we're doing many things with IOT, right? I, I, it's not about just we doing, everyone's doing everything about IOT with the buildings. You talk to the carpet manufacturer, they're embedding devices into that, so you can know the foot traffic. The lighting people, there's, there's IOT sensors in that. You talk to the furniture makers, there's sensors in that, right? So pretty soon, it's not about what we are doing in IOT as the engineering hardware side of it, but it becomes, how are we analyzing this data to create new workplace strategies, right? So that's the focus on now. So there are, of course, there's many, many things that you will see, there's a lot of videos that you will see. We've made buildings smarter. We have done uh, building efficiency, smarter buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But what I am pushing for is how do you analyze this data? So it's a, it's, it's a great thing. One of the experiments that I did for a small suburban office, we put about 400 sensors and every sensor, every five seconds is telling about itself. The temperature, if this room's occupied, whatever, right, it's doing that. Now that generates terabytes of data over a day. It's a small office. Now look at downtown LA, a downtown San Fran with all these buildings. Think about the chatter, the ones and zeros that are coming up from a building, right? Now the building itself is a data platform. Now when the buildings are generating so much of data, a set of buildings in the market, in downtown market. Look at the data, look at the utilization, how the market's using. There's so many, many, many products, intelligent products that you can create. Intelligent workplace strategies you can create. You can create fluid occupancy structures between building to building. You can kind of remove the boundaries of office space. So there's many things that we can do, and I think I'm very passionate about it, not just about what we have done in the past, but where it can take us in the future. So the progress bar relative to the sensors, how would you peg the progress bar? Because are our sensors proliferating now in building standard or is that mostly you guys have to provision the sensors to get the data, get the data flowing? Is it, where are we on that right now from your so, view? So, uh, yes, we need to provision the sensors right now. So right now it is we need to put the sensors. Uh, on the building automation, on the smarter buildings, energy efficiency play, there have been solutions for many years. We have a solution called IntelliCommand where we go advise and make the building smarter. So that's what it is today. But if you talk to some of the lighting manufacturers, some of the newer buildings where we are doing a refit, as part of the lighting procurement, they already have the sensors. So we are at a stage where now it's a project to make the building smarter but very soon it will be built into the building. What kind of real estate um, portfolio do you guys have, just from a scope standpoint, order of magnitude? How big, just to get a sense for the folks watching, you know, it's not like you have one little strip mall I mean, or office building, how big is the portfolio? It's about three billion square foot of management, right? Uh, this is just management. This is the billions of square foot that we manage. But we also handle billions of dollars of transactions through us. And if you think about the industry itself, annually, I don't know how accurate this number is, trillions of dollars of real estate exchanges hands in commercial real estate, right? So that's the vast amount of um, real estate work we do. And if you think about office, when you mm -hmm. said that, if you, think, if you think bubble charts, since we are in the data <laughs> yeah. side, the biggest bubble would be the office. Right, office, we, yeah. we, we do many things around office. So office, there's obviously industrial, mm -hmm. retail, residential, all aspects of it. Think, we are a global company. We operate in 80 countries, 60,000 employees. So 
what we do in US with the focus area can be different from what we do, let's just pick another country like Philippines, right? So think of it, different Global. markets, different maturity, different local needs. So just because yeah. we're, the big bubble is office, that doesn't mean we're not doing something in Philippines which helps the local Philippines real estate, or India for that matter. So you also have some responsibilities over architecture as well. So you're doing a lot of the innovation and thinking about the role that data can play in the services that JLL provides through its commercial real estate business. You also have architecture. Architecture in building has historically been associated with the physical layout of the building. How is architecture, how is the digital and the physical coming together? Because uh, that could be one of the places where these two sides actually start to touch and create conventions for how we think about the digital and the physical uh, at the same time. I have two great examples <laughs> for that. Uh, one example is, have you ever been in a building, where, uh, in an office building, a corporate headquarters of some kind, where you think there's congestion? Have you ever been in a building where you have a nine o'clock meeting and then you need to be at the elevator bank at 8.45. Otherwise, you'll never get the uh, elevator. Peak time, you can't get it, so you had to almost take the conference and, and a call in the lobby, right? You can't do that. So there's a lot of traffic within the building, which is an issue, right? So now you take data through sensors. Let's relate the previous topic together, too. If you have the sensors, you don't have to have purpose-fit sensors, right? Even through devices connecting to wireless access points, right? You can understand how the traffic is moving. And if you think, let's take a little bit different example to that. If you think there's a lot of congestion at Starbucks, which is leading to a lot of bottlenecks and people getting into the building efficiently, right? That means what you do is you put another coffee shop on the other side of the building, so you distribute the traffic. So that's it's like, architecture. It's like a load balancer. It's a load balancer, <laughs> it's a load balancer. But you're physically changing the architecture of the building. That was one example. If you have time on the second one. Now, if you all remember, there was a time that we used to have meeting rooms. Uh, we still have meeting rooms. A calendar, booking of meeting rooms, etc. At least the way I work and many people nowadays work is you don't really have a meeting one week in advance. You're talking to the team and all of a sudden you want to huddle, right? So now, the way conference rooms are getting used, you can look at that and say, do we really need the old style meeting rooms or do we need more collaborative huddle rooms, right? So the new build house architecturally will be a lot more open space, collaborative, and, and will enable this huddle room culture and not the meeting room and corner offices culture. So yes, the physical data, IoT can all lead to those architectural decisions. So that the data literally can be employed to configure a space for a purpose yeah. that perhaps it was originally intended. Yeah. I'm curious, have you ever read Christopher Alexander's A Timeless Way of Building? Have you ever heard of that book? No, I haven't, no. So Christopher Alexander, just as a quick aside, it was a professor here at Berkeley who uh, wrote about, who's one of, the, one of the originators of the concept of pattern languages, uh, and he, uh, and in many respects, yeah. one of the, one of the uh, popularizers of the concepts of architecture, and much of his work then came into the technology industry mm -hmm. as a way of thinking about usability and whatnot. Oh. And so it's kind of fascinating that, that architecture, physical architecture, through Christopher Alexander Zachman and others, yeah. uh, became seminal to IT architecture, yeah. and now we're seeing it come back, and the sole notion of digital, <laughs> and how it affects the physical layout, and what, how we think about configuring spaces in, uh, in, in response to a particular purpose, uh, it, it's interesting to see how it's coming back. That's brilliant, back. that's a cycle. Yeah. That's just fantastic. And, and uh, so I strongly recommend it. It's, uh, yeah. it's an interesting book. Absolutely, we'll do it now. But, the, but when we think about this notion of, uh, how digital and physical in commercial real estate are coming together in, in your role. Is that becoming part of the business proposition that JLL has to its customers? Uh, the idea that we can create more flexible space, more agile space, uh, space that can reconfigure more easily uh, with greater predictability. Is that becoming part of the promise you're making to your customers at this point? Workplace strategies is a very important of what 
advice that we provide to our customers to understand the current state and to create this modern workplace strategies and use IoT to understand. Definitely, it's the core of what we do for any occupants. Large Fortune 500 companies, this is the advice that we constantly provide to them. So your competitor's building may be similar to yours from a physical standpoint, but you hope that your building will be perceived as superior to, by your customers because in part of the digital capabilities that you can bring. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not only just the building, very often uh, people look at us as B2B. We are, right? The way I relate to everybody is you are going into office, you, you, we are all going into the office. Ultimately somebody's decided, but you and I are saying whether this office is good or bad. Right? For the it's data. About, yeah, it's, it's about the data. It's not only about the building differentiating, but the people who are in the building eight to five, they like the building. Shay, this is a great point because this brings back down the point, we hear this all the time in IoT, or oh, the physical plant, in this case yeah, yeah, yeah. commercial real estate, the buildings, they're telling a story through the footprints, and the yeah. digital yeah. footprints, if you will, literally in this case, on the carpet. But that creates optimization for the physical plant or the building, and then there's optimization of that, that asset. Can you share some examples of where that data is driving off property value? Because that would, I can almost see like, okay, you now have data on, are they happy with congestion in the building, but what about people who have to drive to work every day? Is that a good location for the building? If I, you know, there's other new processes that kick out of the data, new insights that can say, hey, well, people are very unhappy because they're stuck in traffic. Yeah. And so there's other things that you can glean out of the data that go off the, the property or the plant or in manufacturing or they're manufacturing or real estate. This is the new thing that's enabling. These new processes are developing where the data can optimize. Can you share anything that you've seen Ab there? Oh, absolutely, and, and, and let me relate that outside of the buildings too, right? So labor, drive time, et cetera, yes, yes, yes. But let's talk about us, something more personal to us, right? If you bought a home, building is definitely important, how it looks, layout, et cetera. But you're also looking at the school district which is not, right? Yeah. You're looking at market, where, where, where's your family, where does your family live, amenities, hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. So commercial buildings are similar. Building is part of the answer, but not the entire answer. It's the labor loss, it's the tax loss, it's the drive time, right? It's about the occupants and also about the business. Why do companies move from one state to another state? Right? There's many, many reasons, not just because the building is nice, there's a lot of other data, yeah. right? So to answer your question, Yes, it's not just building, it, the other data is also very important. So how, how does it impact us, right? We've always, always, analysts have always for many, many years have used various desktop tools to put together these models, labor, drive time, um, et cetera, et cetera, weather, et cetera. But what we are trying to do is create a data library with thousands of data sets that our analysts, not only the poor people with the desktop skills, but our broader definition of analysts can tap into with some of the modern tools and modern architecture, mash it up with their internal data and create new insights. Not just to say, hey building, there's some problem with this building product maintenance assets, but to say. That's low hanging fruit, they get that immediately, Yeah, they get that, right? yeah, absolutely, but to say, Wait a second, it's not only the asset, but it's the weather. We've had unusually certain type of weather, and in this weather, these kind of assets fail. So we should have predicted this failure ahead of time, and we should have prevented this as against waiting for it to fail. Right? That well, kind of decision making needs to happen. So, so, uh, so let me, let me uh, run a scenario by you. <laughs> So I can imagine that uh, you know, at any given time a building might be, it might be 100% occupied, but only 70% of the people show up because of traffic or people are out visiting customers or yeah. whatever else it might be. And so you might be able to say, oh, a certain, you know, there's 30% occup, there's 70% occupancy, we've got 30% open. Uh, people show up and they reveal or they, they pull down information and says, okay, my calendar 
is this. I'm meeting with these people today. I am here. They declare themselves to the building. And the building might say, why don't you sit over in this side because it's going to be cooler over here yeah. than it is going to be over here. Therefore, we don't have to air condition this part. Yeah. Keeps the cost low. We yeah. can also set up services for you so that you'll be sitting near the people you're going to be working with so you don't have to deal with the yeah. up and down of yeah. the elevator. Yeah. So is it that kind of a stuff that we're talking about ultimately? Absolutely, That's all the things that you just said is, is definitely possible. Uh, of course, there's a cost angle to that, right? So to optimize where the people are, but there's also flexibility, right? More and more people, I mean, hoteling's been there for about five, six years now, but hoteling still is within a boundary, like what you just said, right? On Fridays, this department sales function is not there, or Friday sales function is there, something like that. So yes, that kind of optimization is definitely possible. We are seeing those trends in the data. Now, we haven't really closed the loop to act that way, but definitely the future version of hoteling can be more fluid, can be more liquid. Do you anticipate that your buildings will have APIs that occupants will write to? so that they can start, you can provide services through a common set of interfaces and they can consume those services through a common set of interfaces and add data to them? Yes and no, you're kind of really going a little ahead here. <laughs> uh, but yes, about the concierge services. So there's many people, the buildings are ecosystems. I mean, if you look at some of the large buildings, it's like a small city. Mm -hmm. Right? So buildings potentially can have their own Groupon, they have their own Facebook, have their own LinkedIn within the building, right? Because that's where you spend a lot of your time. It's your own personal LinkedIn, personal Facebook, uh, and everything else. So we are doing a lot of that concierge services that's interacting with not only the building, but the community of the building, right? Mm -hmm. Can there be APIs where other people can tap into it? The answer is yes, I see why not, but we're still at the concierge level. Tree, one minute left, I would like you to share with the folks watching what you've learned over the past few years, and most recently, the past um, two years, in how data is transforming your business and the value you're providing to customers. And what should they be thinking of like, and what approaches should they take? It's very simple, it's very simple. Just enable your employees. So our, in our case, it's 60,000 employees. Don't group them, empower them. Uh, power, empower them through self-service. It's possible today. Not only self-service on the data visualization, but empower them by providing all data that they can potentially imagine to create the decisions. They may not use it today, but this thing will catch on. Especially the millennials, they're used to exploring on their own. So to allow them, to give them access to the data, I think is what you need to think of. Yes, the traditional artifacts like data warehouse, data marts, ODSs, um, your big uh, BI infrastructure will all continue to exist, but please look beyond that, not just for a few reports, but enable for everybody with data. Data for Self-service is very important, please do that. <laughs> Tree, thanks so much for sharing the insight, congratulations, love the story. I really think you guys are on really the front edge of an amazing transformation, congratulations, and well, thanks thank for you. sharing. Well thank you, thanks for having JLL at this table. Thank you thank very, you very much. much, you're watching theCUBE here live in San Francisco, part of Informatica World 2016. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE with Peter Burris, General Manager of Wikibon Research, Head of Research for SiliconANGLE Media. We'll be right back with more, you're watching theCUBE. Hi, this is Chris Devaney from DataRoad.